Today we're going to learn about opaque types in Swift. This is something a lot of people find scary, but we're going to demystify it today. Before we jump into things, start by hitting that like button down below. It helps out more than you know. Open up Xcode, create a playground, and let's dig in. So let me create a playground here, and let me center my window. Let's creatively call this opaque video and uh, we'll save it to our desktop. Let me just expand our window here and let's talk about opaque types. So my assumption is you're somewhat familiar with protocols because protocols and opaque types uh, do have a lot of shared uh, behavior and similarity. So let's take a brief example. Let's create a protocol here and it's going to be called a car, right? Respectively, Protocols can also have associated types. I've got a dedicated video on associated types, so if you're unfamiliar, um, maybe go watch that first. So let's create a associated type in here, and we will call it identifier. And we'll say perhaps that we have an ID of type identifier on here, uh, which is going to be a get only property like so. So this uh, associated type will enable us to provide a type alias. So let's create a struct, aka a concrete type of BMW. It's going to conform to car. We'll bring in the identifier type alias and just say that this is going to be a string. Respectively, this ID will be string as well since our identifier is string. And I'll just create this constructor on here, this initializer, and just say ID is ID. And we can actually get rid of the type alias since the compiler is smart enough to infer that this is our associated type. So cool, this makes sense. This has nothing to do with opaque types. So let's talk about some opaque types. Let's say we have a function called get favorite car. And let's say we wanted to return a BMW. That's pretty simple. We can say that the signature of this is a BMW. Well, that's great. So let's say return BMW. And that is not how you spell that. Let's try that again. Takes an ID. We'll be creative and just use the name as the string. And that's all good and well. Then what we can do here is say print string describing. And we'll just call this function right here. If I give this a run in my console at the bottom here, we should see BMW. So not all too surprising. Now, perhaps we have another struct here, and let's say this one is a, let's go with a, I don't know, let's go with a Honda. I was gonna go with a Ferrari, but Hondas are pretty cool too. So now we want this function to be a little more generic, if you will, right? So you might, your first intuition, right, might be, well, instead of returning BMW, I can just return a car, right? So in theory, that makes sense, right? Let's try to give this a run. So if I hit pause and then hit play again, well, we get a compiler error, and this error says use a protocol car as a type must be written as any car. This is actually a newer variant of the error. It used to be, I want to say like a year ago, that you cannot use a return type of car because this protocol has a constraint on self, where self is with an uppercase s. So the advice that Xcode is giving you here is theoretically correct, but there's actually a better way to do it. Using any lowercase a uh, has its own kind of pitfalls, and I'll be doing a video on that as well. But let's understand why it's actually even giving us an error, right? Because at first glance, we have a protocol that's car. We have two things that conform to it. Why the heck can't we return it? And the reason we can't return it is because that we are abstracting when we're using the protocol the type identity from the compiler. In other words, we could have two things that conform to car where the identifier is totally different, right? In other words, this could be an integer, right? So in our BMW and Honda case, they both return a car, right? They both are a car, they both conform to it, but because our associated type can vary, it's yelling at us here, right? Because it doesn't know that whatever we're returning is um, homogenous in a way, right? So let's make this a string again. And this is where we're going to bring in opaque types. Now, the way that I can get this to work is by saying, we're just going to return some car. And you'll see that this error just magically disappears. So obviously, this is going to work now. So I'll hit play and we'll see that BMW gets spit out again. Of course, I can also do the Honda. And let me just change the uh, identifier on this as well. And we'll see it magically working, right? So the point is not that it works. The point is, let's understand why it's working. So the reason it's working is that the sum keyword will actually preserve the type identity at the compiler level, which will enable you to do this. 
So let's take another example, and I actually haven't done this in an actual real world case, so let's see if it works. So I'll hit pause, and I'll hit play, and we'll once again see that in this case, well in this case we're failing because I changed the ID type here. So let me fix this, and we'll hit play once more. And in this case, we do still in fact get a Honda out. Conversely, we can change it back to the string for BMW, and we should get this out as well, even though the type identity is not the same for the associated type identifier. So the summary of this, and hopefully this is clear, is that you should use some when you want to type erase, when you want to type erasing helper on a protocol type. This is really often used in uh, uh, foundation SDKs, in module boundaries, when you're working on modularity. And most of you might have seen the keyword sum used by Apple themselves in Swift UI, right? When you create, uh, let's do it really fast maybe here. When you create a Swift UI view, you can have a view and the body doesn't return a view, right? If you try to return a view, it'll actually yell at you. You actually saw the autocomplete there. The body is a sum view, right? An opaque version of a view and the reason it's able to do this, and the reason Apple engineers built it like this is because you can go and use composable views where the concrete type is not necessarily the same and you can you know, put them together and return something that is a composed view. And that's exactly what you do when you write Swift UI code. So this vertical stack, let's say it has some text in it. This thing takes in a string and then let's say it has a spacer in it. And all of this is gonna be computed to one type erased thing that is of type view. And if I'm not mistaken, the view protocol itself has a associated type on it. So let's see if I can find where the heck view is defined in here. Well, this is going to be a total pain, so let me actually not do that, but you can take my word for it or look up the definition on Apple's website themselves. So that is a summary of opaque types in Swift. It's, you know, to be honest, a pretty complex topic. It can get very, very deep into a rabbit hole of complexity and how this is uh, meant to be used. It's used often with generics, often with the any keyword, lowercase any, and I'll do a separate video on that. But hopefully this is a good primer. Let me know in the comments down below if this made sense. If you have any questions, hopefully I didn't confuse you more. Hit that like button before clicking away. It really helps out more than you know. Share the channel with anyone you know who is into iOS. Maybe tweet it out on our way to 90 and then 100K subs respectively. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.